Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette. In today's video, we thought we'd try something a little bit different and come up with a game. We've got some obscure menswear terminology on deck, and we'll see if I'm stumped by any of these lesser-known menswear terms. <laughs> As longtime viewers of the channel are sure to know, we're big fans of history at the Gentleman's Gazette. We focus mostly on the early to mid 20th century, though we do extend out in either direction for a broader view of the history of menswear on occasion. But while we focus mostly on the so-called golden age of menswear, our script writing team brings different talents to the table. And in particular, one of our script writers, Aaron White, is very passionate about the Edwardian era of menswear. So, for a change of pace today, Aaron put on his thinking cap and tried to come up with some obscure menswear terminology that I might not be familiar with. To take it a step further, though, we framed things as a game. So, I'll be fed the terms, and depending on my answer, I'll get either two points for something that's fully correct, one point for an answer that's roughly in the ballpark, and zero points for an incorrect answer. We encourage you to play along and let us know your score in the comments. And as a disclaimer, though we framed things here a little bit fictionally, the contestant me that you'll be seeing was hearing the terms for the first time and hadn't looked at the script beforehand, so my reactions are in fact natural. With that said, you'll be seeing these natural reactions and how well I played the game, and in between we'll be giving you a bit of background. Without any further ado, then, let's jump right into today's game and play Stump Preston. Hello and welcome to everyone's favorite game, Stump Preston. We are here with Preston Schleter to give him some obscure menswear terminology and see just how he stacks up how many of these terms he can name, or whether or not he'll be thoroughly flummoxed by some of them. Let's get started. Your first term today, term number one, is French bearer. <sighs> Boy, uh, well, we're starting off difficult because I have to say, in all honesty, I really don't have any idea. Um, by the term bearer, I would guess something that is holding something else. So it's probably some sort of support accessory, but no, I have no idea. You get zero points for that one. I'm sorry, that is an incorrect guess. We cannot award you anything. Zero points for the French bearer. Let's see what the explanation is. Our first term today, the French bearer, refers to a piece of fabric sewn into a trouser's waistband in order to keep the trousers straight. In the Victorian era, the French bearer was somewhat reversed from what we would see later. This is to say, the fly would contain one or two extra buttons on the left, and a large tab that extended out of the side seam would be pulled around and buttoned on. In America, however, these were often rendered as just a simple tab. The style evolved over time and is now most commonly seen as a tab extending from the fly with a buttonhole cut into it to receive a button that's located on the trouser waistband. And they can still be found on high quality pairs of trousers today. The idea behind the French bearer is that it will keep the trouser line straight at the waist, and it will also help you to keep your trousers up while buttoning them. Because it also takes some of the stress off of the fly, it can also make your trousers more hard wearing. It's called a French bearer because the style was introduced in France and bore the burden of keeping the trousers up while they were being buttoned. All right, here we go with our second term. Term number two, d'Orsay. Um, this one I think I know, or I might at least be in the ballpark because it came up in a recent video. Does it have to do with the curl of a hat brim? Because I remember that there was a man by the name of d'Orsay who was known to wear his hats with curled brims. So I'm going to guess that it refers to the brim curl. Congratulations, you are absolutely correct and are thus awarded two points. You got that one just right. Let's hear a little bit more about what this term means. 
Term number two, d'Orsay, comes from the famous French dandy Alfred d'Orsay, born in 1801. He was known to wear his top hats with fancy curled brims, and thus the style of a hat with a curled brim came to be named after him. Specifically, it refers to the tightly curled pencil roll you'll find on some top hats, as well as others like Homburgs and bowlers. You can learn more in our comprehensive bowler hat guide here. Next up, our third term, fishtail. I am assuming that this refers to the back of a trouser waistband. Uh, for example, when, when a trouser has, has buttons, can take suspenders, uh, oftentimes those trousers that take suspenders and have buttons have uh, a split in the back of the waistband, and I believe that's usually referred to as a fishtail waistband. Right again, that's another two points for you. Let's hear a little bit more about the background of the fishtail. Our number three term today, fishtail, refers to the fact that when modern trousers were introduced in the 19th century, they had a V-shape in the rear of the waistband. This V-shape was essentially a remnant of the earlier breeches, which would be tied through lacing. Breeches would have a slit down the back, which would sometimes be covered by a gusset, but other times left open. When trousers, which were essentially elongated breeches, became popular at the beginning of the 19th century, they too had this laced closing at the back. And when lacing died out in favor of cinch belts with buckles, the eyelets disappeared, but the slit remained. This left the V shape at the rear of the trousers that allowed the wearer to pull in or let out the waistband. In the 1930s, the waistbands of high-waisted trousers and their V-shaped backs reached quite a height and resembled fishtails, which is when we believe the term originated. Next up, term number four, cagoule. This refers to a piece of outerwear. I know that it's a jacket of some type. I believe it's like a like a middle weight jacket. Um, not necessarily like a rain slicker, but um, yeah, like a middle weight jacket. You're roughly in the ballpark on that one. Not as much information as we would have preferred, however. We'll give you one point for this one. Let's hear more about Cagoule. Next up is cagoule, which is a British word for a lightweight rain jacket, although this term might even be unfamiliar to most British people. This style of jacket is more commonly referred to in Britain as a packamac, which is the name the jackets were marketed under originally. We discovered this word through a rather amusing incident in our Mad Men video, which you can see here. The benefit of this lightweight jacket style is that it could be rolled up and placed, or packed, in a bag. The idea was first patented, or patented, in the 1960s by the Peter Storm brand, but it later shot to popularity once it was sold and marketed by the French brand K-Way in 1965 under the name Pacamac. The name in long form refers to packing a Macintosh, referring to the famous Macintosh-style coat first introduced in Scotland in 1824 and still produced today, though under Japanese ownership. Okay, term number five, retainer. Term number five, retainer. Assuming that it is not referring to the orthodontic implement, um, let's see. Uh, I think I have heard this term. I'm going to know it when you give me the definition, but off the top of my head, I can't recall. No, I'm sorry, we can't award you any points for that one, and no, it doesn't have anything to do with dental appliances. Let's hear more about the history of the term retainer in menswear. You might think our number five term, retainer, also had something to do with teeth, but in fact, it doesn't. In menswear, the term refers to a way to keep your necktie looking presentable. Historically, when men would wear smooth, starched collars, like standing collars or wing collars, there was the potential for the band of a necktie knot to slide around and look unsightly. 
Thus, retainers were used to stop the tie from sliding up the back of the collar and could be found in the form of either small loops of fabric at the back of a shirt running vertically for a gentleman to thread his tie through, or in the form of pins, specially shaped studs, or hooks. Another form of retainer was one that attached to the front collar stud and was designed to attach directly to the tie knot itself, and others were wires or small clips that were used to keep the knot looking good. Next up here is a fun one, Union Suit. Oh yes, uh, I believe I know this one. This would be the one-piece undergarment, um, often depicted in media as being like a red color. Uh, and with a flap on the posterior, if memory serves. Uh, but yeah, a one-piece undergarment. Absolutely correct, that's two more points for you. Let's hear a little bit more about union suits and what they are. In the 19th century, men would wear underthings that were complicated and gaudy with lacing at both the back and on the legs. And before this, men would simply tuck their shirts directly into their trousers, doing today what we would call going commando. It was clear that a better form of underwear was needed, and thus the original onesie, the union suit, was introduced. Specifically, the union suit is a one-piece style of long underwear covering the torso, arms, and legs that was worn from the 1860s up until the mid-20th century. They typically button up at the front and also have a drop seat, which is a flap at the rear. Curiously, these suits were originally created for women, but they eventually caught on for men as well. And the name Union Suit comes from uniting the trouser portion and shirt portion together. In the UK, they were more commonly known as combinations. And in case you're interested, fear not because they are still available today. We might have another stumper on our hands here. Term number seven is Guillot. Oh boy. Uh, well, I'm guessing that this is probably French in origin. This one I'm not sure I've even encountered in all honesty. So I do not have an intelligent guess. What, what would this one be? Ooh, I'm sorry, no points for that one. We can't award you anything there. Let's learn more about Guillot. Next up is Guillot, which comes from the name of the inventor, the Frenchman Charles Guillot. Guillot was a French suspender maker who began his business in 1848, and for the next 100 years, his company would continue to perfect their suspenders, patenting many types of adjuster buckles until their name became synonymous with quality. They've even boasted selling as many as two million suspenders annually. Guillots are famous for their pull tab mechanism, which allows the wearer of suspenders to easily and simply adjust the suspender length without having to open a latch or fiddle with elastic. In other words, you can simply pull the tab on either side to adjust the length. Okay, Preston, term number eight today, Kavanaugh. Ah, okay. Um, this, if I'm not mistaken, typically you'll also hear it referred to as a Kavanaugh edge. Uh, I believe it is a method for finishing the brim of a hat uh, that is, from what I understand, no longer really done by most hatters. Um, but the edge is finished in a certain way as to not have a visible stitch, but not be a raw edge. Congratulations, that's two more points for you. Absolutely correct. Here's more on Kavanaugh. We've got another name for our number eight pick, Kavanaugh. This one is Irish in origin and belongs to John Kavanaugh, a major manufacturer of men's hats for over 50 years. And he can boast some remarkable achievements. While he began his career in 1880, by 1928 he had established his own brand, and in the 1930s he founded both the Hat Corporation of America and the Kavanaugh Hat Research Corporation. Specifically within the world of hats, Kavanaugh is often used to refer to the Kavanaugh Edge, a method of brim finishing to which John Kavanaugh gave his name in 1935. 
The Kavanaugh edge is a hand felted edge created by welting the edge with a thin piece of yarn and then folding the edge back and over and then stitching it in place. The hat then goes through a further felting process that works the inner yarn and the outer hat fibers together, after which the stitches are removed. The hats are then worked by hand in hot water in order to make the brim even. This reinforced the brim of the hat, but the labor costs involved with this style of edge were so high that the brim would often cost as much as the hat itself. Thus, the Kavanaugh edge isn't a method you're going to see employed on modern hats. For more information, you can be sure to check out our hat anatomy video here, and also take a look at our full hats playlist on the channel here. All right, let's see if you can get this one. Term number nine is Psy. So this would be basically the, the armhole, more or less, uh, on either a shirt or a jacket, what have you. Uh, but basically, uh, it you know has a certain pitch to it and a certain size such that the mobility of the arms when raising or lowering or moving around is uh, nice and flexible so that you don't have pulling of the garment. Oh, you might be on a bit of a hot streak now. That's two more points for you. Absolutely correct. Here is more on the term sigh. No, our next term isn't the name of a Star Wars alien, but rather Psy refers to the armhole in dressmaking and tailoring and is more commonly used in the form of the compound word arm Psy. Psy is believed to come from the French word sié, which means to cut. The first time this word was recorded was in the 1825 Etymological Dictionary of the Scottish Language by John Jameson. Some people believe that the word is a corruption of arm's eye, but this is in fact uncorroborated. Most technically then, the term refers not to the hole itself, but rather to the fabric edge onto which the sleeves of a garment are sewn. All right, we're up to our 10th term now, and please, everybody in the audience, keep your giggles to a minimum. Term number 10 here, cockade. I believe that this might also have something to do with hats. But beyond that, I have heard the term in passing, but I wouldn't know how to use it in a sentence, and I can't give you a definition. Ooh, you suck! Well, you did mention hats, judges. I'll allow it. Okay, we're going to give you one point here for the mentioning of hats, but not nearly as much information as you would need for the full two points. So we'll give you one. Let's learn more about this term. No, the cockade isn't a sort of support for your nether regions. In fact, that was covered by one of our earlier terms today. Rather, it in fact refers to a rosette, circular, or flower-shaped knot of ribbons used to associate oneself with a political faction, a particular rank, livery, or allegiance. In the 18th century, these were commonly worn on bicorn or tricorn hats, but could also be occasionally seen on the lapel of a jacket. In later years, they would be represented in all kinds of different materials, including metal when seen on a helmet. Cockades are still worn in some places, for example, to show political affiliation in the UK, and you might also see them in other applications, such as for 4-H clubs in the United States. All right, perhaps another stumper here, Preston. Term number 11, surcoat. <sighs> hmm. Uh-oh, I think we're running into another term with which I am sadly wholly unfamiliar. Um, man, I, I don't even think I have a guess for this one. I'm going to have to take a pass. As I suspected, this one was indeed a stumper. You get no points. Let's learn more about surcoats. Now, it's no surprise that I didn't get this one correct, as it is an item on our list today that's a bit of a stretch. 
After all, we're going to have to go all the way back to the Middle Ages to see this used in its heyday. A surcoat, spelled two different ways, is a garment that was originally seen in the 12th century that would go over the top of a suit of armor. It was generally quite long, reaching all the way down to the mid-calf, with slits that would allow a knight to still ride a horse comfortably. Some had sleeves, though many were sleeveless, and importantly, it shouldn't be confused with the shorter and always sleeveless tabard, which was more commonly worn. Furthermore, tabards were characterized by open sides. As a way for knights to show their allegiance, the surcoat would often be decorated with personal arms, heraldic symbols, allegiance, or iconography. In fact, this is where we get the phrase coat of arms, as the coats were literally displaying the wearer's arms. It also eventually made its way into civilian wear as an expensive top garment in the way of the sideless surcoat and was worn by men and women alike. The fashion lasted until the 15th century when it was phased out by the later Jupon, so don't feel bad if you didn't get this one either. Okay, we're on to term number 12 now. This one is smocking. Well, I would assume somewhere along the way, the linguistics are tied in with what we would now know as a smock, uh, but I could also be totally off base with that. Um, hmm. Given that it has the ing ending, I would assume it's probably some sort of some sort of detail or finishing method or something or other. But with all that said, I do not know. Oh, I'm sorry, we can't award you anything there. That's another goose egg for you on that one. Let's learn more about smocking. For our number 12 pick, we're not referring to Jim Carrey's catchphrase as the mask. Spoken! But rather to a garment-making technique that consists of gathering fabric and embroidering over it, which allows for the fabric to stretch better. It was commonly used for necklines and sleeves to allow the wearer to slip into the garment more easily. Unfortunately, not much is known about the origins of smocking, but it is a very old art form, dating again to the 12th century. Shirts with large collars and heavy smocking were referred to as smocks and were commonly worn by working men in rural Britain, such as farmers and bakers, as utility and work garments to protect their underclothing. Smocking died out in the Industrial Revolution as the garments were long and baggy and therefore could easily be caught or snagged in machines. It does continue to be used today, however, in clothing for women, both children and adults. All right, next up is our 13th term today, collar plate. This is some sort of humorous reference to our suit supply video and is not actually a real term. Uh, I would be very amused because, of course, in that video, uh, the term came up and none of us knew what it meant. Um, but if it is actually a real term and Suit Supply had it listed for a reason, I still don't know what it means because I never took the time to look it up, so I would be curious if it actually has a real definition. Haha, <laughs> yes indeed, we did try to trip you up with this one, but you caught on to our ruse. Let's learn a little bit more about collar pleats, whether they may or may not exist. I caught on to Aaron's trick for our number 13 pick, collar pleat, which, as I mentioned, was a term used by suit supply with which none of us were familiar in store. However, we may have a bit of an answer here today. Sometimes, when the shoulders of a jacket are more sloped than those of the wearer, a horizontal bulge can appear below the collar of a jacket that can be referred to as a collar roll. This can easily be altered by a tailor, and given that Suit Supply is a company with a Dutch origin, it's possible that the word roll was mistranslated as pleat here. This is perhaps because the word pluie in Dutch can mean both bulge and pleat. By the way, credit here goes to Dutch tailor Tom van Hethoff for this revelation. 
This could, therefore, mean that the measurement for the collar pleat actually refers to the correcting of the sloping of the shoulders and removing the collar roll, but this is ultimately just a guess on our part. All right, Preston, it all comes down to this. Your final chance for a few more points here, our 14th term, Onassis. I believe this refers to a particular style of tie knot that was popularly worn by uh, Aristotle Onassis, um, one-time uh, companion of Jackie Kennedy. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, this tie knot basically has the larger front blade of the tie more or less just draped over the knot with actu without actually being inserted through. So it looks... Um, roughly analogous to an ascot or cravat. Um, but yeah, I think that's what it means. Good work, you've ended on a high note. That's another two points for you with a correct answer. And here's more about the term Onassis. Our final term today, Onassis, refers to both a Greek multi-millionaire and shipping magnate, and also to a tie knot. The knot itself is relatively simple, tied just as a standard four in hand, but at the end, rather than inserting the wide blade through the loop at the front, the blade is instead laid over the top and pulled tightly, creating the illusion of no knot at all. For some fictional depictions, you can see it worn in Boardwalk Empire, particularly by the character of Jip Rossetti, and also by Johnny Depp's character in Murder on the Orient Express. Most often, the knot was secured with a pin or sometimes with tweezers behind the shirt. This can be a good way to show off the pattern of your favorite tie, but it isn't a knot that we would recommend wearing in formal settings. And while the knot is now named for Aristotle Onassis, it wasn't originally his invention. In fact, you're essentially tying the knot similarly to how one would tie an ascot. We simply refer to the knot by his name today because he was famously photographed wearing it in the 1960s. All right, Preston, good work. Your final score is 16 points out of a possible 28. Not terrible, not fantastic. Personally, I'd say somewhere in the middle of the road. That does it for today's installment of Stump Preston. Let's throw it back over to the main studio for a bit more information and to close out today's video. And hopefully we'll see you all again soon. So there's our list for you. Overall, I feel that I did fairly well, though I do wish I could have remembered a few more of the terms with which I was vaguely familiar, like retainer, for instance. Overall, though, I'm pleased with my performance. And again, be sure to let us know how you did with your scores in the comments below. And if this is a format you're interested in seeing again, be sure to let us know as well. I'm certainly game for another installment in the future. In today's video, I'm wearing a simple and informal outfit of a subtly multicolored cardigan sweater in blue and brown over a plain blue shirt. My trousers are also plain brown, though they do have a bit of a reddish undertone, and my suede loafers are in a color called tobacco brown. They're from the company Scaroso. Finally today, I'll mention my socks, which are two-toned shadow stripe models from Fort Belvedere in light brown and blue. You can find the socks that I'm wearing in today's video, as well as a wide array of other menswear accessories in the Fort Belvedere shop here. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.